Chapter Sixteen: Massacre at Hagen's Claw. The Iron Duke, Kriegsmarshal Fabian Wolf, surveyed his vast army with a long sigh of satisfaction. Have you ever seen anything so beautiful? He asked the gray-haired captain riding beside him. The old knight's head jerked sideways in a series of involuntary twitches. Then he looked back at the man behind them. Never, he replied, as he studied the sea of rippling banners. Fabian had begun the campaign with a force of considerable size, but over the months it had grown even larger. Becoming an unwieldy host of epic proportions, as the seriousness of the incursion became known, von Raukov had sent reinforcements from every corner of Ostland in support of his beloved protege. It would be impossible to say exactly how many men were now marching behind him. They numbered in the tens of thousands, though. Knights, engineers, spearmen, pistoliers, and greatswords. All eager to serve under such a revered general, Fabian's exploits had already become the stuff of legend. After three decades of combat, his mind was as fast as his sword arm. In fact, he was almost as deadly in real life as he was in the tales his agents had spread across the province. The officers under the Iron Duke's command followed him with a fanatical devotion, and the Elector Count had placed complete trust in him. He had achieved almost everything he had ever desired. The scouts have returned from Mercy's and Kriegs Marshal," said the captain. "Fellhammer's run of luck has finally ended. Mormius didn't even stop to pursue the survivors; they just torched the ruins and continued marching south." Fabian nodded. His only interest seems to be reaching Wolfenburg as quickly as possible. Was there any news of Fellhammer himself? No, I imagine you're right, Ludwig. From what I hear, the captain was as honorable as he was stupid. He'll have held out until the very last minute. As they rode out of the valley, he raised a hand to shield his eyes from the late afternoon sun and looked down across the rain-drenched hills and forests of Ostland. We should meet them very soon," he said, with a slight tremor in his voice. The moment I've waited for all these years has finally arrived. He lifted a pendant from beneath his polished cuirass and studied it closely. It was the ivory wolf's head his uncle had given him all those years ago in the unknown house. After this battle, the name Wolf will never be forgotten," he said, turning the pendant slowly in his fingers. He lowered his voice and smiled at Ludwig. And once my master has accepted the wonderful gift I'm bringing him, I'll become the mightiest warrior the old world has ever seen. Ludwig shook his head. I can understand why the ruinous powers would wish you to bring them such a great sacrifice. To lead so many soldiers into their grasp is truly a wondrous gift. But there's something I can't understand. Fabian looked around to see if any of the other officers were near enough to overhear. Then he leant closer to Ludwig and nodded for him to continue. If you're taking this great army to your master as a sacrifice, will Mormius know not to strike you down as he had done so many others? Does he understand the bargain you've struck? Fabian leant back in his saddle and stroked his mustache. I imagine he knows nothing of me or my true purpose. My master won't care which of us triumphs; either result will amuse him. If I can defeat Mormius and his rabble and make my great sacrifice, he'll reward me in ways I'm only just beginning to comprehend. But if I fail and Mormius lays waste to Wolfenburg, the power I sought will be bestowed on him. We're playthings, nothing more. Just an amusing diversion for the great deceiver. Mormius will only see me as an obstacle on the road to glory. Fabian clutched the hilt of his sword and smiled. He should make a worthy opponent. Ludwig nodded, and rubbed his cold, lifeless eyes. Well, whatever the outcome, 
It will be good to finally reach him. We seem to have been marching for decades. Almost half a mile behind Fabian and his officers rode Baron Maximilian von During at the head of his squadron of knights Griffin. Beside him rode Jakob, Ratboy, and Anna. Can you be sure we're talking about the same man? asked Ratboy, looking at the group of banners at the head of the army. Do you really think that's your brother up there? Wolf nodded. There's no other explanation. I was filled with dread at the thought of my brother marching with this army, and now I find he's the man leading it. His brow was creased in a thunderous scowl. It's much worse than I anticipated. Fabian's not the hero these men think he is. His master isn't von Raukov, but some unspeakable unholy force. I can't imagine what he has planned for this army, but it's certainly not victory. But it makes no sense, said Maximilian. I've heard tales of the Iron Duke's victories ever since I arrived in Ostland. He has driven back countless invasions. Why would he have done that if he's some kind of pawn of the Dark Powers? Wolf looked over at his old friend. He is playing for higher stakes. All he's ever dreamt of is to be a great hero, the greatest hero, in fact. As a child, he pictured himself as a valiant knight, torn straight from the old lays and ballads. He always wanted to march at the head of a great empire army such as this one. He has been carefully biding his time and gradually winning the trust of the elector count. And now he's leading the largest force in the province. Maximilian shook his head. You'll never get within thirty feet of him, unless he wanted you to. His personal honor guard watch him constantly. He calls them the Oberhau, and their swordsmanship is legendary. They wield great swords as easily as if they were rapiers. He frowned. They wear fearsome helmets, fashioned in the shape of a snarling wolf, and are famed for their ruthlessness. Rumor has it that the Iron Drake trains each of them personally. But if your suspicions are correct, maybe there's more to this training than meets the eye. Wolf nodded. To reveal myself now would be a mistake. Fabian has an entire army fawning at his feet. He'd simply have me arrested. I imagine these Oberhau would have no qualms about executing me if Fabian ordered it. Then what will you do? asked Anna, looking around anxiously at the ranks of marching soldiers that surrounded them. Bide my time, replied Wolf. Ostland's on the edge of ruin. Even if I could convince these men that their general is a traitor, I'm not sure I should. It's only Fabian that's holding them together. But if he's a cultist of some kind, he's probably leading them all to their deaths. She gasped, anxiously stroking the velvety stubble that covered her scalp. Wolf nodded. All I can do is watch and wait. He turned to Maximilian. We should move a little closer to the command group. Maximilian nodded and urged his horse into a canter, signaling for the other knights to pick up their pace too. After a few hours... Maximilian nodded at a large hill that sat up at the end of a long, narrow defile. It was topped with five odd slender towers of stone. There's Fabian's destination, he said. Hagen's Claw. Wolf peered at the distant hill. Have you spoken to my brother, then? Not personally, no, but two nights ago I met with his closest adviser, the captain of the Oberhau. Maximilian pursed his lips, as though tasting something bitter. His name is Ludwig von Gross, and apparently he's Fabian's oldest friend. But there's something about that man that made my skin crawl. Von Gross? muttered Wolf, frowning. The name does sound familiar, but I spent most of my childhood in a temple. I never really knew my brother's friends. Why did you find this von Gross so unpleasant? Maximilian shrugged. Hard to say, really. I knew him by reputation anyway, 
is considered unusually brutal, even by the standards of the Oberhau. But it wasn't that. There was something in his manner that made me feel on my guard. His words were quite deferential, and his tone was perfectly reasonable, but I still felt as though he was mocking me somehow. I see. But he explained Fabian's strategy to you? Yes, although not in any detail. He simply told me the same as he told the other senior officers. The Iron Duke wants to reach an old burial site named Hagen's Claw, and have time to dig in before the marauders arrive. His judgment has been sound on every previous occasion, so I simply thanked von Gross for the information and ushered him out of my tent as quickly as possible. He shuddered at the memory. He started leafing through one of my tactical manuals with a ridiculous grin on his face, poking fun at the techniques and asking if I really used them. If I not found an excuse to shove him out the door, I think we might have come to blows. Fabian's plan seems quite logical, though. The hill is steep and topped with ancient monoliths, so there will be plenty of cover and places to position the guns. There's also an unusually narrow valley behind it, so if things go badly, we'd be able to inflict very heavy losses on Mormius's men as we withdrew. Ratboy watched the smoldering red sun as it sank behind the hill, silhouetting the towering obelisks that guarded the valley. There were four intact stones and a fifth that was broken and leaning to one side like a thumb. Whose tombs are they? he asked. They're like nothing I've ever seen before. Maximilian shook his head. I got no idea, friend. I know they're old beyond reckoning, but other than that I've only heard rumors and legends. Maybe one of the Ostlanders would know, he said, waving at the ranks of black and white troops that surrounded them. I think even they might struggle, though. As the sun sank lower, bathing the landscape in a scarlet light, the army reached the summit of the hill and began planting their standards between the strange columns. Half of the fifth stone had fallen, to be eagerly embraced by the shrubs and long grass beneath, but those that still stood reached even higher than Radboy had expected. As he rode between them, they seemed to bow over his head, so great was their height. Who was Hagen? He asked in hushed tones, eyeing the obelisks with suspicion. I believe he was some kind of tribal warlord, a contemporary of Sigmar's, who met his end here, answered Maximilian. The polished steel of his visor flashed red as he raised it to get a better view of the stones. The Ostlanders tell all sorts of gruesome tales about him, Allegedly, when he suspected one of his men of coveting his wife, he accused him of being no better than a wild scavenger, tied him to one of these stones, and pierced his side with a knife. Then he left him to the mercy of the wolves that roam hereabouts. Ratboy looked up at the somber columns with even more suspicion, wondering if it were shadows or dark stains he could see on the lichen-covered stone. How did Hagen die? asked Ratboy. Well, if the legends are true, his power corrupted him, and eventually he became a disciple of the Dark Gods. Sigmar heard stories of his strange behavior, and traveled out here to confront him. He found Hagen attempting to use the stones as part of some unspeakable rite, so they fought. Maximilian gave Ratboy a wry smile. And Hagen died. Wolf saw the concern on Ratboy's face, and gave Maximilian a disapproving shake of his head. The old knight chuckled through his thick silver beard. Very well, he said. I suppose I shouldn't be filling your head with legends and ghosts. You'll soon have plenty of mortal foes to keep you busy. He shrugged. Anyway, odd as it is, the Iron Duke had this sight in mind right from the start of the campaign. He sent scouts up here weeks ago to prepare for the battle. We're going to engage the enemy exactly where he planned to. Whatever your master thinks of him, Fabian is no fool. 
He must have had good reason to drive us so hard, and ensure that we fought here rather than any other spot. He waved his men over to one of the few areas of hillside, not already swarming with soldiers. That seems as good a place as any. Let's prepare ourselves. Once they'd reached the spot, Ratboy dropped from his horse and helped his master down from his. Then he perched on one of the pieces of fallen stone, and, following the example of the knight's griffin, began to polish his weapon in preparation for the battle. As he did so, he noticed Wolf looking anxiously through the bustling crowds that covered the hillside. Ratboy followed his gaze and saw the Iron Duke standard, snapping proudly at the summit a wolf and a bull, rearing side by side on a black background. He tried to imagine how wolf must feel, to be so close to his brother after all these years. I wonder what he'll do when the time comes to act, said a voice in his ear. Radboy turned to see Anna, watching wolf too. He dusted down a patch of moss, and she sat next to him on the stone. A brother is a brother, she said, sitting next to him. Whatever happened in the past? Ratboy shrugged. He's been so concerned with tracking Fabian down, but I don't think he ever actually worked out what to do when he found him. I've never seen him so subdued. I suppose he imagined he would be dealing with a soldier, not the head of an army. Anna shrugged. How's your hand? she asked, peeling back the bandages. The wound was beginning to heal up, but his fingers had set in a crooked, useless fist. She shook her head and frowned. It looks like I managed to stave off any infection, but I doubt you'll ever be much use as a musician. Ratboy smiled. I don't think I was ever destined for artistic greatness. The pain had been growing worse, and he grimaced as he flexed his scarred, bent fingers. Some of the movement has returned already, he said, trying to hide the extent of his discomfort. I may even be able to use this fancy sword properly one day. He raised the blade in his left hand, so that the metal caught the sun's dying rays. I've almost got the hang of using my other hand now anyway. He looked over at Anna. In all the excitement of the last few days, he had almost forgotten her loss. How are you feeling? he asked. She continued studying his hand for a few seconds, frowning with worry. Then she placed it back in his lap and studied a ring on her finger. It was the one Wolf had brought from the temple, the one that had belonged to the abbess. As she spoke, she traced her finger over the dove that decorated it. The sisters were my only family, she said. I only pray that some of them had managed to flee before... She paused and closed her eyes. When she opened them again, they were bright with tears. I doubt a single one of them would have abandoned the people in their care. Ratboy took her hand. There were soldiers in there with them. They may have evacuated some of the sisters before the fighting started. Anna nodded. It is possible, she said, with little conviction. She squeezed Ratboy's hand and took a deep breath. I don't feel completely alone now, though. You have shown me great kindness. She met Ratboy's anxious gaze with a smile, then looked out across the gloomy landscape. I may... I may not have to wait long before I meet my sisters again anyway. It seems that nothing can stop this Mormius or his hideous creatures. Ratboy recalled the Battle of Mercy's End with a shudder. I wonder if Gryphius or Captain Fellhammer escaped, he said. She shrugged. Fellhammer knew these tunnels as well as anyone. Gryphius was carrying a terrible wound, though, I don't think we'll ever see him again. Radboy nodded and looked deep into her eyes. And what about you, Anna? You're not seeking a glorious end. What is there here for you? Mormius's hordes will arrive any day now. Who can say what will happen, 
but I doubt many of us will survive. Shouldn't you head back towards Wolfenburg? You could find other members of your order. I imagine there's much healing to be done in the capital. You should leave while you still can. And would you come with me, rat boy? This is no place for a young, inexperienced acolyte. A desperate battle won't help you to complete your training. You could leave with me. Head south and present yourself at the first chapter house you find. In a year or so, you'd be a fully trained warrior priest, just like your master. Think how much use your life would be if you didn't end it here as a novice. Ratboy shook his head fiercely. I would never abandon Brother Wolf. His face flushed with color, and he turned away from the priestess, embarrassed by the passion in his voice. He'll need me tonight, more than ever before, and if it means my life, then I'll be proud to die by his side. Anna nodded and loosed his hand. She gave him a sad smile and climbed to her feet. I know, she said quietly. I owe you my life, and if there's anything I can do to aid you, I'll be here to do it. She looked around at the rows of pale, nervous faces rushing past them. And I imagine you won't be the only one who'll need my help. Ratboy stood and pulled her towards him. His eyes were wide with emotion, but before he could speak, a chorus of shouts erupted from the surrounding soldiers. The troops' preparations suddenly became much more urgent. Valets and equerries sprinted past and sergeants began barking commands at their men. What's happened? said Ratboy, turning from Anna and looking out into the darkness of the surrounding meadows. Listen, said Wolf, stepping past them both and climbing up onto the stone. He looked out across the rippling pools of grass and shadow. Ratboy held his breath and heard an odd sound on the breeze. He climbed up beside his master and followed his gaze. He could see nothing, but as the wind shifted slightly to the east, the noise suddenly swelled. He heard a horn of some kind, but it was playing no melody he could recognize. The thin, plaintive sound simply undulated slowly up and down, like the baleful song of a wading bird. There was a clatter of armor as the surrounding men formed themselves into orderly ranks. The dark, feral helmets of the Oberhau could be seen all over the hill, dashing back and forth as they directed regiments into the formations Fabian had requested. The squadrons of knights and pistoliers took up positions near the bottom of the incline, while every man with a bow was ordered up to the summit to stand alongside the engineers and their bizarre assortment of black powder weapons. As the eerie, surging sound grew louder, the archers arrayed themselves in a long line across the top of Hagen's claw and began to ready their weapons. We should take our positions, said Wolf, placing a hand on Ratboy's shoulder. They climbed down from the stone and, with Anna in tow, rushed back over to where Maximilian was inspecting his men. The knights had already mounted their chargers, and as Maximilian looked them up and down, he nodded with satisfaction. Despite the panic and noise erupting all around them, the knights' griffins sat calmly in their saddles, with straight backs and raised chins. To Ratboy, they looked as immovable as the monoliths that towered above them. We don't have very long, said Maximilian, turning from his men and facing Wolf. Would you do us the honor of giving us your blessing, old friend? Wolf paused, dragging himself from his reverie with visible effort. Then he nodded slowly and stopped before the rows of gleaming knights. He removed a book from his cuirass, signaled for the men to lower their heads, and muttered a quick prayer. To Ratboy, though, his words sounded oddly flat. The passion that usually filled his voice was gone, and he recited the words with a vague, distracted air. Where there is weakness, give us strength. Where there is lowliness, give us majesty. Where there is death, give us eternity. Then he moved along the ranks of men and placed his hand on each of their swords in turn. 
muttering a blessing as he went. Fill this heart with faith undying, gild this sword with strength unceasing. Once he had reached the final night, Wolf climbed up onto his own horse and positioned himself at the front of the squadron, next to Maximilian. There was a look of bleak despondency on his face. The old knight gave Wolf a concerned glance. This isn't the first time we face such a foe, he said, nodding to the row of flickering lights that had begun to appear on the horizon. Wolf shook his head, but did not look up from where his hands were resting on the pommel of his saddle. It's not what's out there that worries me, Maximilian, he muttered. Maximilian lowered his voice and leant closer to his old friend. I have faith in you, Jacob, even if you do not. Whoever and whatever you face tonight, I know you will emerge victorious. Wolf lifted his eyes, and Ratboy saw agony and doubt burning there. The priest opened his mouth to answer Maximilian, but the words were lost, as Hagen's claw exploded into an inferno of sound and flame. All along the hillside, rows of cannon and mortar boomed into life. Ratboy flinched and gripped his horse's reins in terror, taken by surprise, as the guns unleashed hell on the vague shapes massing below. With the sound of the guns still ringing in his ears, he looked around and saw to his shame that Wolf, Maximilian, and Anna were all sat quite calmly, peering through the growing darkness, to see the effect of the volley. The range of these things is amazing, said Maximilian, as some of the lights below them flickered and died. The enemy was still far from the foot of the hill, and it was hard to see anything very clearly, but the droning horn faltered for a few seconds, and several of Fabian's regiments burst into spontaneous cheers. It's a little early to begin victory celebrations, said Anna, giving Ratboy a wry grin. I'm going to move back up the hill. There's nothing I can do in the thick of the fighting. I'll see if I can find the surgeons and wait for the wounded to arrive. She placed a hand on Ratboy's arm and opened her mouth to say something. Then she changed her mind and simply nodded at him. He gave her a mute nod in reply and watched her ride away between the ranks of stern-faced soldiers. As she disappeared from view, he felt an almost overwhelming urge to rush after her, but a look at his master's troubled face gave him new resolve, and he drew his sword instead. Here they come, said Maximilian, snapping his visor down. Ratboy saw that the tides of light below were now rushing towards the hill at great speed. The drone of the horn shifted up a key, becoming a shrill scream, and he began to make out individual figures at the head of Mormius's army. He frowned. There was something odd about the men sprinting towards them. They were clad in crude, brutal armor, tatty shreds of hide and helmets crowned their vicious tusks, but it was not their dress that made him frown. There was something about their proportions that confused him. He turned to Wolf with a question on his lips, but his master was engrossed in his own thoughts, and barely seemed to register the army hurtling towards them. As the men moved closer, other marauders emerged behind them, and it was then that Ratboy realized what was so strange about the warriors in the vanguard. They were colossal. The marauders behind them were obviously well built, but they barely reached the waists of the warriors in the front line. As the giants pounded across the field towards them, Ratboy noticed that their faces were as gray as manfold corpses, and their canines were grotesquely enlarged, jutting from their drooling mouths like boar tusks. What are they? he gasped. Ogres of some kind, replied Maximilian, his voice ringing oddly through his helmet. They're a fearsome breed, from what I've heard. Fond of human flesh. He raised his sword in silent command, and there was a scraping of steel behind him, as the ranks of knights all drew their own weapons in perfect unison. Maximilian gestured to Ratboy's sword. That should serve you well, son, 
Ratboy nodded and lifted the ornate weapon higher, but as he saw the haunted expression on Wolf's face, doubt filled him. Just then, another, even louder explosion from the artillery erupted behind them, and Ratboy's horse flinched violently, almost throwing him from the saddle. Steady, said Maximilian, as the first row of creatures started to dash up the hill towards them, led by the huge lumbering ogres. As the creatures grew closer, Radboy realized he could hear their hoarse, grunting breath beneath the wailing of the horn. He looked at Maximilian, wondering what he was waiting for. In just a few more minutes, the monsters would be all over them. The Baron was faceless behind the polished steel of his helmet and did not acknowledge him. Just as Ratboy was about to speak, a dark shape passed overhead. The archers at the top of the hill had finally loosed their arrows, and the dusk grew even deeper as the lethal cloud filled the sky. The marauders were so close by this point that even the fading light could not obscure their outlines. Thousands of black and white flecked arrows thudded into their thick hides. Countless ranks of marauders fell stumbling back the hill, clutching at their throats and chests as they went, but the ogres barely stumbled. They hardly seemed to notice the arrows that sank into them. With a chorus of derisive grunts and snarls, they simply snapped the shafts and continued rushing up the hill. They're unstoppable, muttered Ratboy, looking around to see if the other soldiers would hold their ground in the face of such a horrendous foe. Watch, said the Baron, gently turning Ratboy's face back towards the front line. The grunting, stomping mass of corruption was only a few feet away from the vanguard of Fabian's army, when, at the bark of a captain, the soldiers in the front line raised an impressive array of pistols, muskets, and crossbows. The men did not fire, however, watching for the captain's signal as the ogres lurched towards them. Soon, they were so close that Ratboy could smell the thick, meaty stink of their flesh. At the very last minute, the captain stepped out to meet them. It was one of the wolf-helmed Oberhau, and as the first ogre approached him, the captain calmly fired his flintlock pistol into the monster's head, tearing the skin from its skull with a fierce blast of gunpowder. As the report of the pistol echoed across the hillside, the creature finally paused. It raised its hands to the pulpy mess where its face had been, and gave a grunt of confusion. Then it toppled lifelessly down the hill. The captain dropped to one knee, lowered his head, and pointed his sword at the enemy. At a silent signal, the entire front line fired their weapons. The noise of so many guns blasting in concert was incredible, and the hillside lit up in a brief, sulfurous flash. It was so bright that for a second the ogres' faces resembled those of grotesque actors, leering out into the foothills of an infernal theater. Then the lead shot ripped the flesh from their bones and left gaping blackened holes in their chests. Even in death, though, many of them seemed incapable of holding, stumbling forwards even as viscera spilled through their hands and their legs collapsed beneath them. As a second thunderous volley tore into them, most of the ogres finally ground to a bloody halt. Only one actually managed to blunder, half-blind, into Fabian's army. It was even larger than the others, and its misshapen head was crowned with a thick white Mohican. The left side of its face was hanging down around its neck like a glistening scarf, revealing its long teeth in a fierce rictus grin as it stumbled, bellowing up the hill. Black and white ranks of soldiers crowded around the towering figure, trying to block its way but the thing's rage and momentum powered it through them. Its only weapon was a rough-hewn piece of sharpened iron, but the crude blade was taller than any of the men who pressed around the ogre, and the monster cut them down as easily as grass, pausing only to tear at their faces with its gleaming exposed teeth. The ogre wove a spiraling, confused path through the soldiers, and Ratboy realized with a rush of dismay that it was heading towards the knight's griffin, 
Dozens of blades rose and fell against it, but to no avail. Then, with a crash like waves against rocks, the full force of the marauder army plowed into the Ostlanders. The battle began in earnest, and the ogre was forgotten. A cacophony of screamed commands engulfed Ratboy as the surrounding regiments began charging down the hill, howling with fear and bloodlust as they rushed towards the enemy. Meanwhile, clouds of arrows were still swarming overhead, and a thud thud of mortar fire had begun, sending whistling iron balls down into the approaching hordes, where they exploded into fragments of white hot metal. Ratboy looked at Maximilian and saw to his surprise that he still sat utterly still. Watching with calm disdain as Hagen's claw descended into a riot of fear and pandemonium. Behind the baron, his knights awaited, equally patient at the baron's side. Wolf seemed unaware of the fighting. His huge armor-clad shape remained motionless, as he studied his hands with a perplexed frown on his face. The injured ogre was now only a few feet away, hammering its brutal weapon through ranks of men, utterly oblivious to the countless wounds that networked its calloused flesh. With a roar of frustration, the thing slammed its huge shard of metal into a row of spearmen attempting to block its way, sending them reeling backwards in a shower of splintered wood and bone. The men screamed in horror and pain, as the ogre trampled maniacally over their bodies, crushing ribs, lungs, and hearts as it continued up the hill. Then, with a confused snort, the beast found itself facing a dazzling sight. Maximilian and his knights. Wolf finally looked up from the back of his hands to see a bleeding colossus staring directly at him. The ogre seemed enraged by the priest's air of devotion. Ignoring the knights, it made straight for Wolf, raising the huge piece of metal above its head with a belching roar. Wolf and the surrounding knights scattered their horses just in time as the hunk of iron slashed deep into the soft turf. Anger flashed in Wolf's eyes, and as his horse circled the beast, he drew his warhammer from his back, testing its weight as though he'd never held the weapon before. Ratboy saw the muscles tighten in his master's powerful jaw, and he wondered if the priest's anger was at the sight of the monster or at the thought of his own inaction. Sigmar! bellowed Wolf, with such fury that everyone within earshot paused and looked in his direction. Even the ogre hesitated, lowering its guard for a second, and turned to face the priest with a slack-jawed grunt. Absolves you, continued Wolf, slamming his hammer into the thing's knee. The crack of breaking bone rang out, audible even above the gunshots further down the hill. The ogre's leg folded backwards, sending it crashing to the ground, and the last traces of doubt vanished from Wolf's eyes. Dismounting, he grasped the hammer in both hands, strode towards the dazed creature, and slammed the weapon into its face. As he did so, the rekindled flames of his devotion rushed from his flesh and into the metal, so that as it connected with the monster's jaw, the head of the hammer was throbbing with white, holy radiance. The ogre's skull detonated in an explosion of blood and light as it sprawled backwards across the scorched grass. Wolf looked around at the soldiers charging down the hill with surprise on his face. Then he clambered back onto his horse and turned to face Maximilian. His ornate iron cuirass was drenched in the ogre's blood and his face was flushed with exertion, but, as he wiped the gore from his shaven head, he smiled at his friends. We've got work to do, he said, nodding at the carnage below. The initial wave of ogres had been replaced by the crush of human marauders, so great that the Ostlanders were being already forced to concede ground. A chorus of grunts and screams had replaced the sound of gunfire as the two armies locked together in a heaving, flailing forest of limbs and spears. Maximilian nodded in reply and signaled for his standard-bearer to raise their colors. 
As the cloth unfurled in the breeze, the baron snapped his reins and began riding down the hill at a slow trot. Behind him, the ranks of knights followed suit, maintaining their neat, orderly lines as they made their way through the battle. As they neared the bottom of the hill, Ratway realized that despite the size of Fabian's army, the tide had already turned against them. Marauders were flooding out of the darkness like a plague. The horizon had vanished behind a sea of pale, muscled flesh and scaled, mutated limbs. Ratboy saw horsemen, with long, drooping mustaches, and others with helmets fashioned from the skulls of great beasts. Behind them marched the blue-eyed tribesmen, wearing human pelts and bearded, screaming goliaths, with chains woven through their tattooed flesh. Despite their initial display of firepower, the sheer volume of the enemy was now overwhelming the Ostlanders. Guns were useless in close combat, and the bare-chested marauders hacked and clawed their way through them in an orgy of bloodletting. Ratboy swallowed hard as he neared the front line. The din of clanging swords and screaming wounded was horrendous, and as the last traces of sun vanished, the slaughter became a strange, gruesome tableau. The rows of grim faces looked suddenly flat and unreal, as silver moonlight threw them into sharp relief. The crush of bodies was so great that before Ratboy and the others could reach the marauders, their horses grounded to a halt, hemmed in by clanking, serried ranks of empire soldiers several feet away from the fighting. The heaving mass of shields and spears was rocked by tides of movement, lurching and stumbling from left to right, and Ratboy's horse strained beneath him, struggling to keep its balance in the tumult. Despite his fear of the marauders, Ratboy found it worse to be stranded like this, so close, but unable to act. What do we do now? he called to Wolf. The priest was right next to him, but he had to yell to be heard over the clamor. Wolf was looking back up the hill at the banners that surrounded the command group. There was no sign that Fabian and his officers were going to join the fighting. At the sound of his acolyte's voice, Wolf turned to face him with a frown of confusion. What? He yelled back, leaning forward and cupping his ear. What do we do? repeated Ratboy, raising his voice to a hoarse yell. Wolf pointed his hammer at the advancing ranks of marauders. Their numbers were quickly overwhelming the Empire soldiers. Wait! he replied, making the sign of the hammer over his chest. And pray! They did not have to wait long. Far down in the valley, there was a flash of silver, as a winged figure lifted up over the heads of the marauders. From this distance, it was barely more than a glittering speck, but Ratboy thought he could make out multiple pairs of wings, in the moonlight, shimmering as it flew towards them. It's Mormius, he gasped, leaning forward in his saddle to try and see more clearly. The din of battle drowned out his words, but he assumed he was right. As Mormius approached, Ratboy saw him raise a long tapered horn to his lips, and the awful undulating sound echoed around Hagen's claw again. At the sound of Mormius's horn, his army surged forward with renewed vigor. They seemed utterly consumed by passion, howling furiously and throwing themselves against the Ostlanders with complete abandon. The captain of the Oberhau tried rallying his men, swinging his greatsword with such phenomenal speed that a circle of headless corpses quickly built up around him. As the marauders pushed the other Empire troops slowly back up the hill, the captain found himself alone in an island of calm at the heart of the enemy vanguard. As the rows of muscled, mutated barbarians crowded around him, the captain's strikes grew so fast his movements were hard to follow. Only the wolf mask of his helmet was visible, seeming to snarl with delight at the constant supply of fresh blood. Finally, inevitably, the circle closed in on him as the marauders used the sheer mass of their bodies to stifle his blows.
Radboy saw the lupine snout of his helmet one last time, before it vanished under a tsunami of swords, axes, and spears. As Mormius' horns peeled out across the battlefield, driving his men forwards, Radboy's concerns about reaching the front line evaporated. The Ostlanders were now falling in droves, and the fight was moving towards him with alarming speed. A nearby group of halberdiers dropped their weapons in panic and tried to scramble back up the hill, but they were blocked by the dignified, immovable presence of the knight's griffin. The marauders made short work of the stranded men, hacking at their backs with broad iron axes and ripping out their throats with crab-like claws. As the last of the halberdiers fell to the ground, Maximilian's knights finally had room to maneuver, and he waved them on with a twirl of his sword. As their chargers leapt forwards, Radboy's horse followed suit, and he found himself flying towards the screaming, blood-drenched marauders, with Wolf's broad, armored back just ahead of him. The knights fought with vicious, carefully drilled efficiency. Their swords rose and fell in graceful arcs, quickly cutting a path through the enemy and leaving a trail of broken claws and splintered shields. Wolf seemed to forget his brother for a moment, and let the heat of the battle consume him, swinging his hammer with brutal effectiveness, and screaming out blessings as he pommeled and crunched his way through the marauders. Radboy tried to imitate the knight's unruled precision, but as the sneering marauders crowded around him, his horse reared in panic and Ratboy lashed out in a desperate frenzy. The strange sword felt light and swift in his hands, and his frantic blows were surprisingly effective. Few marauders made it past Wolf's pounding hammer, but those that did met a blur of flashing steel. Across the hillside, other knightly orders were entering the fray, and for a while the enemy's advance slowed. The winged figure of Mormius was still gliding towards Hagen's claw, and as he approached, his horn rang out once more. The wavering note was now so loud that several of the Ostlanders had to clamp their hands over their ears to block out the trilling sound. The marauders exploded into action, driven onwards by the close proximity of their general's rallying cry. Even Maximilian's knights struggled to defend themselves against such unhinged aggression. The bare-chested barbarians threw themselves at the polished armor of the knights, with no thought for their own safety. For every one that fell, gutted to the bloody ground, a dozen others clambered up onto the horses, their eyes rolling wildly as they wrenched and hacked at the man's armor. The crush of bodies slowly halted the knight's advance. In fact, as the horn drove them to even greater fury, the marauders began to push them back up the hill. As the marauders swarmed over them, Radboy saw one of the knights dragged from his charger. A crowd of enemy soldiers had grappled and shoved at his horse with such fury that it eventually toppled onto its side, thrashing and kicking in fear as the marauders plunged knives beneath its scalloped armor. The knight rolled clear of the horse, and continued to fight with calm dispassion, but down on the ground he stood little chance against the seething mob. The other knights showed no sign of recognition as he vanished beneath a flurry of blows. They simply closed ranks and continued to fight with a quiet dignity, as they were forced slowly back towards the monoliths. A furious roar echoed across the hillside, as the marauders greeted the arrival of Mormius. He dropped gracefully down amongst them, and folded his flashing wings behind his back. Radboy found it hard to look at him directly. It seemed almost as though a fragment of the bright, gibbous moon had broken away and fallen to earth. He could see clearly how tall the man was, though. He was almost as big as the ogres that had led the attack. But as he strode towards the Empire troops, he showed none of the ogres' animal simplicity. He sauntered casually through the carnage, as though promenading into a ballroom, flicking his red hair back from his face as he drew a long two-handed sword. The first Ostlanders to face him were so paralyzed with fear that Mormius simply ignored them 
strolling past the rows of shocked faces and leaving the marauders that followed in his wake to hack them to the ground. Two of Fabian's honor guard attempted to rally the Ostlanders, charging at Mormius with their two-handed swords above their heads and calling furiously to the ashen-faced onlookers to follow. As they neared the winged colossus, a detachment of swordsmen grudgingly shuffled after them wide-eyed and trembling in the face of such an unholy vision. As the wolf-helmed Oberhau reached Mormius, they dropped into a low crouch and edged slowly towards him. At the sight of the two officers, Mormius revealed his perfect teeth in a broad smile. His regal gait became a lurching, twitching stagger as a fit of laughter gripped him, but then his pretty face twisted with anguish. Be calm, he hissed in a desperate voice, shaking his head furiously as the soldiers approached. It's not funny. He took a deep, calming breath, and his crystal wings spread out behind him, creating a flash of moonlight so powerful that it temporarily blinded the Oberhau. They faltered, raising their hands to try to block the glare and with a casual flick of his wrist, Mormius lopped their heads from their shoulders. The swordsman balked in the face of such incredible speed, and as the giggling, cursing champion stepped towards them, they backed away, raising their shields defensively against the glare of his glimmering breastplate. Mormius continued up the hill. As the terrified Empire soldiers shuffled back, they created a broad path ahead of him leading straight towards the distant banners of the command group. The only possible danger to the champion seemed to come from himself, as his expression alternated from a leering grin to an agonized scowl. He began slapping his armor-clad fists against the side of his head, punching himself with such force that blood began to flow from his ears. "'We must stop him!' cried Wolf, leaping back into his saddle. If he reaches Fabian, something terrible will happen. I can feel it. Maximilian nodded and, with a wave of his sword, ordered his men to abandon their futile attempt to advance. He led them sideways across the hill, through the moonlit jumble of corpses and broken guns. The crush of bodies was just as great in that direction, though, and they soon found themselves mired once more in the mass of struggling soldiers. The knights hacked and shoved with all their strength, but the marauders seemed endless. Radboy's face and hair were slick with blood, and his voice was hoarse from screaming. He paused, mid-strike, as a familiar face looked out at him from beneath the heaving throngs. He could see no more than a pair of pale eyes, glaring at him from behind the flailing mass of swords and limbs, but something about the face chilled him. He had no time to dwell on it, though, as another lumbering brute lashed out at him, swinging a battered sword straight at his head. He parried the blow and kicked the marauder to the floor, and when he looked again, the face in the crowd was gone. Wolf suddenly gave a howl of frustration, and Ratboy looked over in alarm, surprised by the desperation in the priest's voice. Wolf's face was purple with rage, and his scarlet robes were drenched with sweat and blood. His inability to reach the champion seemed to have driven him to distraction. There was a feral look in his eyes that Ratboy had never seen before. Wolf leapt from his horse, diving face first into the enemy. His heavy frame hit the Northman with such force that a whole row of them toppled backwards under his weight. Before they could clamber to their feet, Wolf grabbed the nearest one by his greasy hair and slammed his warhammer into his face. Bow down before Sigmar! He screamed, pounding the weapon repeatedly into the man's shattered head, and shaking him violently back and forth, even though he was obviously already dead. Receive his judgment! Ratboy watched in horror as his master ripped and pounded his way through the struggling men. He seemed unhinged, inhuman even. As he bludgeoned his way towards Mormius, the priest was no longer taking heed of who crumpled beneath his bone-crunching hammer blows. 
Ratboy saw several Empire soldiers smashed to the ground by his blind, uncontrollable rage. The sight of such untrammeled fervor reminded him of someone, and with a sickening rush of fear, Ratboy realized who he had seen in the crowd. It was the witch hunter, Sermon, alive and here with them on Hagen's claw. He must have trailed them right across the province, but for what purpose? He looked around, but could see no sign of the frail old man among the crowds of struggling warriors. Ducking beneath a spear thrust, he dropped from his horse and ran to his master's side. On approaching him, he paused, as Wolf screamed a tirade of furious blessings into the pulped faces of his victims, he suddenly seemed indistinguishable from Sermon. Is that what I will become? wondered Ratboy, lowering his sword in horror. A vision of Raphael's corpse filled his head, surrounded by his adoring crowds of penitent followers, tearing their flesh for the glory of Sigmar. Where were they now? Broken and forgotten on a muddy field, sacrificed on the whim of their master. Anna's intense gray eyes suddenly filled Ratboy's thoughts, and he looked back up the hill, wondering if he had made a terrible mistake. I can't do this, he suddenly realized, blanching at the sight of so much bloodshed. He turned away from his master and began to climb back up the hill. Rough hands grabbed him beneath the shoulders and hoisted him up onto a horse. He found himself sat behind Maximilian. The knight's helmet was gone, and his steel-gray beard was splattered with blood, but he had a fierce grin on his face. "'We'd best keep up with your master, eh, lad?' he said, giving Ratboy a suspicious look. "'A wolf needs his pack around him at a time like this.' Ratboy flushed with embarrassment and nodded, gripping his sword a little tighter. Wolf's frenzied attack had cleared a path across the hillside, and as Maximilian rode after him, Ratboy got his first glimpse of Mormius. The champion was only about two dozen yards away, and he noticed again that some of his crystal armor was stained and dark. The black shadow had now spread from his left hand all the way down to his waist, and from the awkward one-handed way Mormius held his sword, Ratboy guessed he was in a lot of pain. He is wounded, he yelled into Maximilian's ear, pointing at the champion's arm. The knight nodded as he steered his horse around the struggling figures, closing quickly on Wolf. Doubtless his corruption is eating him up from the inside. Should make our job a little easier. As they reached Wolf's side, there was no sign of his wrath diminishing. He was fighting towards the gleaming champion with jerking spasmodic movements that reminded Ratboy of a marionette or an automaton. As he shouldered and punched his way into the clearing around Mormius, the priest's robes were hanging in tatters from beneath his dented armor, but he still had his warhammer grasped firmly in both hands, and it was glowing with a light almost as dazzling as Mormius's armor. Blasphemer! He gasped, slamming his hammer against one of the stone columns with a dull clang. Mormius paused at the sound and looked back. He met Wolf's bloody skull with a wild grin. A priest! A priest! A warrior priest! He sang, strolling back down the hill towards him. Have you come to pray for me? He gave out a thin shriek of laughter and looked around at the rows of terrified faces that lined his path. I think you may be a little too late. His laughter grew so hard that tears welled in his eyes and as he neared Wolf, his face was flushed with color. Your congregation seems to have already written me off. Speak carefully yelled Maximilian, as his horse crashed through the rows of cowering soldiers a little further up the hill. As they rode down towards the champion, Ratboy's pulse began to throb painfully in his temples. Mormius's towering shape was essentially human, but corruption seemed to pour out of it. Ratboy found it impossible to meet the giant's eyes as he turned towards them. What's this?
asked Mormius, leaning heavily on his sword as the battle raged around them. He wiped the tears from his eyes and shook his head. A welcoming committee? Finally! I was beginning to feel quite snubbed. Anyone would think you people had forgotten your manners. Maximilian's horse tossed its mane nervously as the knight rode towards Mormius and Wolf. As they approached him, Ratboy realized that his master, well-built as he was, barely reached the flashing plates of Mormius's chest armor. "'You abomination!' muttered Wolf, wiping the gore from his shaven head and striding forwards. He pounded his gauntleted fist against the hammer device on his chest armor. "'Sigmar denounces you with every muscle, heart, and sinew of his holy empire!' The champion's laughter faded as he saw the passion burning in Wolf's eyes. "'I see no muscle here,' he replied, waving his sword nonchalantly at the rows of petrified onlookers. "'Maybe Sigmar has tired of his sniveling bastard offspring. Maybe he's forsaken you, little priest.' Wolf gave no reply but broke into a sprint, raising his hammer to strike as he raced towards Mormius. Mormius turned slightly so that the crystals on his armor flashed in the moonlight and presented Wolf with an image of his own livid face. The priest stumbled in confusion and lowered his warhammer. Mormius stepped to one side and sliced his greatsword at Wolf's neck. The blade hit Maximilian's sword with a ringing sound. With Mormius distracted by Wolf, the knight had managed to approach the champion, and was now just a few feet away. He had extended his sword just in time to parry the blow and save Wolf's life, but Mormius's strength was such that the knight's weapon flew from his hand, spinning across the battlefield towards the crowds of onlookers. The old soldier cried out, clutching his arm. Mormius rounded on Maximilian and Ratboy with a sardonic smile on his plump lips. He strode towards them, but then stumbled and winced. Ratboy noticed again that the crystals on his left arm were dark and lifeless. In fact, now that he saw it a little closer, he realized that his whole side was atrophied and twisted. There was a rending metallic crunch as Wolf's hammer slammed into the small of Mormius's back. The champion's eyes widened in shock, and he stumbled towards Maximilian's horse. As he fell past them, Ratboy lashed out with his sword, and a flash of red erupted from the champion's face. Mormius slammed to the ground like a felled tree. Wolf strode forwards and struck again, but Mormius rolled to one side, and a blow pounded harmlessly against the ground. The champion lurched to his feet and turned to face his free attackers, batting his long eyelashes in shock and pouting as he clutched his bleeding cheek. Then his mouth set in a determined line as he saw several other knights griffin fighting their way through the carnage and lining up behind Maximilian with their swords raised. He lowered his hand from his face, allowing the blood to flow freely from his pale neck and grinned. Then. He rocked back on his heels, rolling his eyes at the moon and letting out another burst of hysterical laughter. "'Little friends!' he gasped, waving his sword at the scene behind them. "'Your determination is commendable, but can't you see? It's already over!' Wolf and the others turned to see that marauders were now flooding the hillside in such numbers that the Empire troops had no option but to retreat. Huge crowds of the black and white clad figures were rushing back towards the banners at the top of the hill. Trumpets were blaring in several places as the sergeants ordered their men to retreat. Mormius spread his wings to the breeze that was buffeting the hillside and lifted himself up over the heads of his opponents. I've no time to entertain you, he called apologetically, as he flew up the hill towards the command group. As he glided over the soldiers, he lifted his long horn from his back, and a mournful undulating sound washed across the hillside once more, driving the marauders to new levels of ferocity as they rushed after him. <laughs> 
Wolf vaulted up onto his horse, and without even pausing to acknowledge his friends, he raced up to the hill. Maximilian and the other knights charged after him, led by the flashing shape of Mormius. The retreat was quickly becoming a rout. A second wave of ogres had swelled the ranks of the marauders, and as they grunted and stomped their way into the fray, the Empire soldiers fled for their lives. As they thundered back up the hill, Radboy saw that the enemy had even overrun the command tents, trampling the striped canvas to the ground as they chased their prey. Where's Fabian? he called. Maximilian shook his head and gave no reply as they raced towards the tents. As they reached the summit, Radboy saw no sign of the Iron Duke or his officers. The tents were empty, and as the Ostlanders saw that they had been abandoned to their fate, they screamed in fear and confusion before fleeing down into the narrow valley behind Hagen's claw. Thousands of them were already scrambling and tumbling into the ravine, leaving a trail of broken weapons and banners as they went. Mormius was flitting back and forth like a carrion bird, searching desperately for Fabian and lashing out at the fleeing shapes in frustration. His great wings were silhouetted against the moon as he landed on top of one of the stone columns and looked down over the battlefield. Even from such a high vantage point, his enemy eluded him, and the champion howled and gibbered at the stars as though the heavens themselves were responsible for Fabian's escape. Without their general to lead them, the Empire army lost all sense of order, and its neat ranks collapsed into an unruly jumble of beleaguered knights and panic-stricken foot-soldiers. Ratboy scoured the confusing scene for any sign of his master, but it was impossible to make out individual figures in the riot of plumed helms and tattered banners. This is it, he decided. This is the moment my master feared. Fabian has abandoned the army to its doom. He has led them here to die. The ringing of swords filled his ears, and he turned to see Maximilian's knights were now a lone island of purity, surrounded by a host of screaming, grotesque brutes. The marauders were clambering over each other in their desperation to attack the knights, and Radboy saw immediately that they were about to be overwhelmed. We must flee with the others, he cried, into the valley. Maximilian shook his head and hissed with frustration, lashing out at the clutching fingers trying to drag him from his horse, unwilling to show weakness in the face of such a barbarian rabble. Within seconds of Ratboy's cry, however, the whole front rank of knights collapsed with a scream of twisting metal and injured steeds. Retreat! cried the baron in a despairing voice, as several of his men were dragged to the floor and butchered right before his eyes. Pull back into the valley! He turned his horse up the hill and led his men in a desperate charge away from the advancing hordes. Even then, on the very edge of defeat, the knights carried themselves with a quiet dignity that belied the hopelessness of their situation. As they reached the summit of the hill, they slowed to a canter and formed themselves back into neat, ordered ranks. Maximilian and Ratboy looked back to see a myriad of grotesque shapes teeming over the hillside, towering, slack-jawed ogres, sinewy, broad-shouldered barbarians, and lumbering, unnatural shapes, all heeding the call of the winged monster perched on the top of the obelisk. My master's probably down there cried Ratboy, straining to be heard over the din and pointing down into the crowded valley on the other side of the hill. He'll be trying to find his brother. Maximilian regained his composure and nodded calmly at the acolyte. We'd not last a minute here on our own anyway, and down there we can at least defend our countrymen as they retreat. He signaled to his men with a flourish of his sword, and led them down the hill after the fleeing Ostlanders. Whatever Fabian's motives, he cried as they rode down the hill, he was right about this ravine. The pass is so narrow, the marauders will find themselves in a bottleneck as they try to attack. Their numbers will work against them in such a confined space.' 
Mormius will pay dearly for every foot he advances. Ratboy nodded vaguely, but he was only half listening to the Baron. As they raced down the hill, with the enemy hordes at their backs, he scoured the crowds of fleeing soldiers for any sign of a white-robed girl or an old man with pale, staring eyes. If there were any officers left alive, Ratboy saw no sign of them as he reached the valley floor. The Ostlanders were less an army than a terrified, demoralized mob. For months, Fabian had been the cornerstone of their faith. The incredible luck and charisma of the Iron Duke had made the impossible seem possible. But now he was gone, the full horror of their situation had hit home. Handgunners, swordsmen and halberdiers all piled together in a desperate headlong stampede through the narrow valley. The knight's griffon brought up the rear of the fractured army, but all they could do was flee with the others, as Mormius swooped down into the ravine at the head of his demonic host. They must stand and fight, snarled Maximilian, as they raced after the receding army. Where's that wretched traitor Fabian? If no one turns this army around, they'll just spill out onto the plains and be butchered. At least in here we've got a chance at seeing the dawn. Ratboy nodded weakly, but could think of nothing to say in reply. He had scoured the terrified faces that surrounded them, but had seen no sign of Wolf or Anna. His oath to protect Wolf, whatever the cost, had been proven worthless, and he had failed the priestess too. He looked down at his beautiful sword with disgust. What use had it been in the end? As they fled from Hagen's claw, all his earlier doubts returned to him. The Empire had raised an army of incredible size. Thousands of good men had abandoned their lives in the name of Sigmar, and what had it achieved? What began as a noble crusade was about to end as a pitiful farce. He realized his dreams of following in Wolf's footsteps were nothing more than a romantic fantasy. As the army neared the end of the valley, he shook his head in despair and let the sword slip from his grip. A rolling boom, like the sound of thunder, filled the ravine. The horrified Ostlanders looked back over their shoulders to see what fresh horror had been summoned to assault them. The whole army stumbled to a halt and gawped in shock. The far end of the canyon was collapsing in on itself. The walls were engulfed in smoke and dust as a curtain of crumbling rock hurtled down onto Mormius's men. The champion flew clear of the explosion, beating his wings in a desperate attempt to escape the avalanche, but the great host beneath him vanished, as the walls of the valley slid downwards in a lethal, deafening storm of granite. As the dust and stones settled, the Ostlanders stared in bewildered silence at a huge silvery cloud rippling towards them. Then a movement far above it caught their eye. All along the sides of the ravine, rows of soldiers began to appear, led by a proud, slender figure clad in dark plate armor and wearing a helmet stylized to resemble a wolf's head. Behind him fluttered a white and black banner, showing a wolf and a bull. A chorus of shocked voices erupted from the men around Ratboy. "'It's the Iron Duke!' they cried. "'He hasn't abandoned us!' Maximilian tugged at his stiff silver beard and gave out a bark of laughter. "'The old devil must have planned this. He intended for us to retreat into the ravine.' Ratboy peered through the thinning smoke and saw the surviving marauders climbing from the rubble. They made a pitiful sight as they dragged themselves clear on twisted, broken limbs while howling at their champion to save them. Grey dust covered their bodies, giving them the appearance of ghosts or revenants crawling from a rocky grave. But how could Fabian have predicted this avalanche? He didn't predict it. He created it, replied Maximilian with a nod of grudging respect. I thought it was scouts he sent out all those weeks back, but they must have been engineers. He waved along the top of the canyon, where the ranks of soldiers had appeared. 
This whole area must have been lined with black powder, primed and waiting for us to lead the marauders to their doom. And meanwhile Fabian kept a reserve of soldiers waiting here to strike. He shook his head at the pitiful state of the Ostlanders that surrounded them. He really must be made of iron, though. Rather than let his men know the plan and risk it being discovered by spies, he let them fight on, oblivious to his intentions, until they were forced to pull back in a genuine retreat. Radboy gasped at the brutal logic. To sacrifice so many men on a gamble made his head spin. What if they hadn't retreated? What if the explosives hadn't detonated? Then he remembered. Fabian would have no qualms about sacrificing Empire soldiers if he was worshipping at the altar of some dark ancient power. As Mormius flitted back and forth above his screaming, broken wreck of an army, Fabian led ranks of fresh men down into the valley. With a pounding of drums and hooves, they charged into the crowds of wounded marauders. The soldiers around Ratboy lifted their tired heads and cheered. Then, forgetting their fear and exhaustion, they rushed back down the gully, eager to join the slaughter. Maximilian led his men after them in a slow, stately trot. At the sight of Fabian, Mormius let out a strangled wail and dived towards him. His wings blurred and he drew his greatsword from his back as he fell. He smashed into the ranks of the Oberhau with the force of a comet, sending out a plume of dust from the side of the ravine. For a few minutes, Radboy struggled to make out what was happening. Then, as the haze cleared, he made out the two men, locked in a fierce duel on the outcrop of rock. The colossal winged champion dwarfed Fabian, but as he swung his greatsword at him in a flurry of wild, furious blows, the Iron Duke danced easily out of the way wielding his own sword with calm, controlled skill. As the lines of fresh, eager-faced soldiers charged down towards them, the surviving marauders turned and fled, limping and clambering back up towards Hagen's claw. Many of them were too crippled to run, and the vengeful Ostlanders fell on them with undisguised glee. As the clouds of dust folded and banked through the moonlit canyon, Ratboy caught brief glimpses of the carnage. Most of the Empire soldiers had thought themselves as good as dead, and their relief now manifested itself in an orgy of bloodletting. Swords and knives plunged into the struggling marauders as they reached up pathetically towards their embattled champion. As the Knight's Griffin approached the bloody scene, Ratboy saw a familiar face and cried out with delight. The broad-chested shape of his master was striding purposefully through the clouds of dust, still screaming his litany, and pounding his two-handed warhammer into the crumpled bodies of his foes. "'Master Wolf!' cried Ratboy, leaping from his horse and sprinting towards him. At the sound of his acolyte, Wolf looked up from his work with a fierce expression on his face. The ornate scrollwork of his cuirass was glistening with blood and his dark eyes were burning with rage. As he saw Ratboy, his eyes cleared a little, and his expression softened. He looked down at his gore-splattered chest and limbs in confusion. Then he lowered his hammer to the ground with a thud, and took in the shocking brutality that surrounded him. In their fury, the Ostlanders had become as bestial as the marauders, tearing through the wounded Northmen like rabid dogs. As Wolf's fury waned, so did his strength. He had only taken one step towards Ratboy when his legs collapsed beneath him. He dropped to his knees with a grunt of exhaustion. Ratboy rushed to his side and, taking his arm, helped him to his feet. We've won, he gasped, trying to sound cheerful despite the horrific sights that surrounded them. He gestured to the crowds of figures, scrambling back up towards the obelisks. The marauders are retreating. Wolf's face remained fixed in a grim scowl. Where's my brother? He croaked through bloody teeth. Ratboy pointed up to the dueling figures, lunging and slashing at each other on the rocky outcrop. It was an incredible sight. 
they seem to rat boy like gods, locked in a contest to decide the fate of all humanity. Even at this distance, though, it was obvious that Mormius was struggling. The whole of his blackened left side looked twisted and deformed, and his leg kept buckling beneath him as Fabian forced him closer to the edge of the precipice. Wolf's armor rattled as he fought through the bloodthirsty mob, trying to get a better view. He and Ratboy both gasped as they saw Fabian plant his boot in the champion's deformed leg and sent him stumbling back towards the chasm. Mormius's legs crashed one last time as he crumpled to the floor, but before he could lift himself, Fabian turned on his heel and sliced his sword cleanly through his neck. The soldiers ceased their butchery for a moment, and an eerie silence descended over the canyon. Then there was an explosion of cheers as Fabian strode calmly into view, with Mormius's severed head dangling from his upraised fist.